here we are. This is yet another Ask Us Anything session. Today's focus is about Kubernetes operations, but as always, you can ask anything else if you want. You do not need to stick to the main subject. So please, 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 please prepare your questions. We will start answering them as soon as they come. And while waiting for them, let me introduce to you uh, two guys that have really tough time. I'm not sure how they will be able to answer our questions if they cannot set up microphone even, but we'll see. Uh, we have Vitiel and Guy from Commodore over there. There we go. They did manage to set up microphones, so maybe they know something about Kubernetes as well. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, welcome. There is Engin, Engin over here, Edson, uh, Tulsi, Ipos. I cannot even pronounce all your names. Uh, great to have you here. So uh, while waiting for the questions to start pouring in, uh, Etl Guy, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Guy. Uh, I'm a solution architect at Commodore. Used to be a developer for a long time. And around the infrastructure and DevOps tool for, I think, 10 years, uh, less and more. Yeah, and, and my name is Etl Schwartz. I'm the CTO of Commodore. Uh, in my background, I did a lot of infra and backend, both for like large enterprises such as eBay and very small startup as well. So I know the, the in and outs and also like a Kubernetes fan for the last six, seven years, something like that. Uh, so that as well. Okay, I th I thought you would say for the last fifteen years, you know. Sometimes yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, even before yeah. that. I, I know Kubernetes before it existed. Yeah. <laughs> before all, before okay. the containers as well. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with questions uh, from Sharat. What are the best tools for observability? What are the best metrics for observability? <laughs> you want to jump in? dive in yeah like i think for the tools there are like a lot of them but i think if we're talking about open source tools and not vendor tools like uh, prometheus grafana and opal telemetry are like above all the others in terms of capabilities scale <sighs> enterprise grade um, which always good and about the best metrics I would say that out of the box, they came like all of the tools come with a lot of good scraper exporters with that integrating with many tools. Um, the problem is usually when when it comes to application metrics, because you need to export them, you need to uh, actually code things if you want to gain more visibility uh, or more observability on the other side. So there is no bad me best metrics. You just need to have the right metrics when you need it in place. Uh, because if you don't have it and something happens, you are like blind. Yeah, I, I will also like, you know, do like a self-promotion, a small self-promotion, but Commodore that basically allows you to publish with Kubernetes is a great tool if you are using Kubernetes. Uh, I think that in Guy said like the great tool in the open source, Jaeger is also great if you are more into like tracing. So that's a great tool. The, the most common like setup we see is a combination of, I don't know, like Jaeger, Kibana, and Grafana with Prometheus together, like Grafana is the UI, Prometheus is the backend. Uh, so I think like that's the most common one. Okay, there we go. You got your question. Let's go to the next one, Tulsi. What are the best resources to start Kubernetes? I cannot answer that question because I, I've been in Kubernetes for so long that I'm kind of I'm more into reading the docs now, you know, things before they get published. Uh, uh, I don't know. Do you have any suggestion? The the Kubernetes the hard way by Kelsey, right? It's like yeah. a classic. I think it's like a good classic, and, and also like the official docs are nice. Like uh, when I started Kubernetes, there's like the edX course. <clears throat> I think. Uh, that is like quite nice and helps you start with you know the basics. But I think that the best thing you can do is to be honest, like to have someone by your side that know Kubernetes. Like I think that's the best way to jumpstart, like learning only by yourself. It is possible, but Kubernetes has so many pitfalls that you are going to to fall on your face basically. So if you are more in like the enterprise and you work in a company, 
and you are not learning Kubernetes just for the fun of it, which is fun, right? Uh, I will try to bring some external advisor as well, or like to hire someone. Because uh, if not learning only from like the public uh, documentation, and so on, uh, it will be very painful for you and the organization probably. And, and we see it quite a lot for Commodore users. One thing I will add, I mean, the recommendation Kubernetes, the hard way, I love it. Everybody should read it. And then nobody should apply it <laughs> in real world. I think that Tim Kelsey said last time we spoke something along the lines, kind of like, I don't do that anymore. Kind of like, I, I don't do QBI at ADM anymore, right? Yeah, no, it's like, you know, just says to be hardcore, right? Like, uh, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> Nice. So what's next? Uh, DK, carry or something like that. Can you describe the differences between <laughs> DevOps and platform engineer? I see many people say DevOps is that, but just seems like platform engineering is DevOps in the cloud. Wow. Let, let, let me give you my two cents and then I'll let <laughs> the guests uh, fill it in. Uh, I don't think that one excludes the other or one kills the other. From my perspective, DevOps is about combining development and operations into one coherent group or team capable of delivering application from idea all the way until it is running in production and then also making sure that it continues running in production, right? I think it's about creating those self-sufficient teams, uh, combining those different types of expertise in a team, right? Uh, and platform engineering, from my perspective, is about creating internal tooling, internal platform that is tailor-made for the needs of a company, combines all the tools that the company uses and creates that abstraction layer on top that simplifies usage uh, for everybody else, you know, because you, one person might, might have seven years of experience in Terraform, but it's unrealistic to expect that everybody will know everything about it and that everybody will know everything about AWS and so on and so forth. So platform engineering, from my perspective, is that internal tooling that simplifies specific processes or whatever you're doing in a company and enables everybody else to do things instead of opening Jira tickets, right? So I don't think that one excludes the other, nor that DevOps is dead. Uh, Platform engineering is about creating tools, internal tools, and DevOps is about combining ops and dev in, in together. I don't know whether you, ETL, or guys see the same way, but at least those are my two cents. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. I think it's more about responsibilities than the naming of, of the role. Uh, we meet a lot of like DevOps, platform engineers, SREs, that sometimes do completely different tasks and sometimes they do all of the same. Um, in some uh, organization, we see platform engineers actually responsible for the Kubernetes cluster and infrastructure. Uh, sometimes uh, they do make a Kubernetes more accessible, Victor, as you said, to uh, development uh, teams. Uh, but in some cases, they do what, like integrating development operations. So I would say that it's not the same when we talk about responsibilities, but in depends on the company, it can be do the same responsibilities, um, but definitely not that. I think that if you're talking about what Victor explained about uh, the platform, about who is responsible about the platform and the operations, it kind of makes sense. And both of the roles have like good place in, in this ecosystem. Yeah, uh, I will say like even to take it a bit further, like uh, Victor, like, you know, I, I'm in the industry for you know dozens of years, something like that. And I keep on hearing that DevOps is not a real thing. Like that's the most common thing. Like DevOps is a culture. It's not a real thing. But somehow <coughs> I still meet a lot of people who see themselves as DevOps on a daily basis. Right. And ask them, what do you do? And they say DevOps. And this is even like con to, to contradict the fact that a lot of people say there's no such thing. There is like an SRE, there is like a CICD expert, there's a platform expert. In the end of the day, uh, I think, you know, DevOps is the one or it's like a name, a general a generic name for the uh, for the person that know how to really tie the operation and the developer, right? I think like platform engineer is like a subset of DevOps and SRE is like another subset. And there's like a very big mix of people who do a lot of 
DevOps things and call themselves DevOps and, you know, they are not dead. And, you know, I don't see this change anytime sooner. And maybe, and now there's like the DevSecOps, right? Like, so, you know, a lot of people are trying to take a chunk out of this like DevOps pie and say that now nah, it doesn't really exist. Or it's going to die, but I don't see it anytime in the future. And even if platform engineer would be like the new DevOps, you know, like uh, people really love to bury technologies. Like I hear that Java is dead for the last like 25 years. I don't know, like I think Java is 25 years old. And ever since it's created, like, yeah, Java is dead, Java is dead. But in the end of today, like people are still using it uh, quite, quite extensively. So, you know, I think it's like a nice hype. It's like, it sounds good. Yeah, DevOps is dead. Uh, but I think it's only on the rise in terms of people who are responsible for like operation and dev. It's only on the rise. And uh, after the, the article was published, like, you know, I went to LinkedIn just to see and I searched for like how many like DevOps people there are versus how many people are like platform engineers. And, you know, there are like around like 100 X more like DevOps than uh, platform engineers. So at least for like the LinkedIn title, right? Like it's not the exact science. So uh, yeah, like uh, if I was a DevOps, I, will, I wouldn't be worried that I'm going to die like uh, anytime soon. That's that's my take. <laughs> Depends on your age, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah, you know, DevOps is it's not like you're immortal, right? Exactly. Uh, kind of like I know some very some very experienced old timers uh, there around the eighties, nineties already kind of like so maybe. Uh, and yeah, fifteen years of uh, Kubernetes, <laughs> you said, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, from Anish, how do we aggregate alerts from different sources like Prometheus, um, native clouds, etc.? Basically, a good alert manager I'm looking for. Mm, yeah, so the question is a bit like, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, like Commodore, for example, can showcase you all of your alerts in like one single timeline. So that's a great tool. I know that tools like BigPand and Mulesoft know how to really aggregate alerts into like a single coherent alert. Like, I don't, like, PagerDuty together with Rundex claim that they do that. Like, I didn't really found any out-of-the-box solution that does that well for, like, very big enterprises. There are sometimes the DevOps, or I don't know, like, the platform engineers that are responsible for doing those sort of correlation, like, taking a couple of alerts and, like, aggregating them into, like, one single big alert. But out-of-the-box, like, I didn't saw anything that is even, like, nice and um, guy victor yeah me like me as well i i as you mentioned like big panda mooks of this kind of tools that do that i didn't see something that do not have like really amazing capabilities that you see many alerts and just aggregate all of them and you get one alert and understand that you uh, need to solve only that root cause and everything will be fixed kind of magic I would say it's an area that you still need to have some expertise of knowledge, especially if you get like not one, two or five, if you get like 15 or 100 alerts at the same time, it's it's a struggle. <laughs> I guess it, it also depends on how we use and define alerts. Like in my specific case, alerts, I see alerts more like some part of the system sending me a notification or Slack that there is something wrong somewhere. And uh, from there on, I go to tools that will, doesn't matter whether it's Commodore or Grafana or this or that, that where I can explore and see what's going on, right? So uh, from that perspective, I honestly don't even care about alert aggregation. I care alerts as if telling me there's something wrong. Uh, and then going and taking a look at the dashboards and the graphs and the information and the logs and uh, you know querying metrics and doing whatever needs to be done, right? Um, but I guess the question was more aimed towards can we kind of have maybe not? I'm not sure whether it would be called alerts. Whether we can have a one place with all the anomalies in a system, right? Yeah, like I'm not sure what was the question, but uh, yeah, like I think uh, no, but I'm not sure. Like, what did they like? Uh, what did she refer to? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think I think you know that, that that's pretty much it in terms of tools. Okay, uh, Jesus, Jesus or Jesus, depending on where you come from, 
Uh, any good strategies to pivot from IT into DevOps, ideally without taking a salary hit? Uh, I, I will I will answer the latter part. I never heard anybody getting a salary hit for going to DevOps. DevOps is overpaid, if anything, it, not underpaid. Dead, right? It is dead. We <laughs> said it like earlier, like you should go to platform engineering instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but but you know there are still companies who didn't get the memo. <laughs> you can skip a bad word. <laughs> yeah. Now the the problem I might see from from this is that if somebody is in IT. Uh, I'm not sure what IT means. I'm, I'm guessing by IT it means I'm managing, you know, laptops in my company. And uh, I don't know what guy Itil, Do you know what IT means today? Is it kind of like managing we, we active see, directory? Ah, uh, I see people. I don't know. Like you know, IT might be like active directory and things like that. We do yeah. see on premise mainly for companies that are like may, maybe like very like uh, GPU intensive or have like a lot of AI. So they have like real machines and someone need to pet those machines, right? Like I do see it. So like, I, I'm not sure what does it mean exactly like the IT, but I think like getting yourself familiar with YAMLs, with code is like the best way to do that jump between like IT and, and you know, and DevOps. Like, I think that's the basic of even like automating the Active Directory, automating some parts of your process, like DevOps, it's, it's all around that. So I think like that's my advice. Probably then the most challenging part, if I guessed correctly what the question is around, is actually doing the dev part, <laughs> right? Because I guess the people on the right side usually are more focused on ops, kind of like I know the system, whatever the system is, I know which command to execute, which button to click and stuff like that. But then there is that that other challenge kind of, can I develop something? Whatever the language is. I mean, it can, when I say develop, it can be uh, data structures in YAML, it can be bash scripts, it can be GoCo, Java. Mm -hmm. Development can be many in many, many different forms. But figuring out how to write code, that could be the, the major challenge, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that when you are like working on, let's say IT or more on the infrastructure side, there is like roles that you can go uh, from the infrastructure side to be, for example, cloud engineer. It's a popular role in a few companies that you manage the cloud, but from the VM side. So if you're moving from bare metal or uh, virtual machines to the cloud infrastructure team, it's like, more fluent to move to DevOps. So it doesn't have to be like a big jump. Uh, today I manage uh, uh, like hardware servers and the day tomorrow like writing pipelines uh, for my uh, dev team. So it can be like a small jump moving into DevOps. Engin, oh Engin, what would be an alert you would always set up on, on a Kubernetes cluster to get informed? I'm guessing that the question is kind of if you can do only one. I, th I think I would go crazy if I would be limited to one. Probably like if I, if I have to choose like the one is like make sure that I, all of my pods are like available. I think like and has like a, a above like a certain threshold in the end of the day, almost everything is like encapsulated in that specific pod, right? Like all of Kubernetes is around making those pods run. Like everything else is just a, a supporting character in the story, which is like the container and the, and the pod itself. So something around the, like the availability of my pods is, is the bare minimum. And then you start like adding what's the status of the node, CPU, memory, and things like that. But that, that's, that's me at least. But then the moment that Kubernetes fails, kind of like, you have no idea. Ah, like that, <laughs> that's like for a different question. You know uh, what? It, it no, but it said one alert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe <laughs> HTTP requests, kind of like whether the, your applications respond. <laughs> that would that would cover the failure of the cluster, I'm guessing. I don't know. Anyway, Hopefully. one is too little. Yeah. Uh, Epos, I have a question. I have two microservices up. One runs Apache Ignite, and the other is in an API app. When I make a request from the API to get the data from the Apache Ignite app, sometimes it returns the requested data and sometimes it returns 500 internal error. Please, do you know of any open source tool or Azure 
<laughs> solution that I can use. Oh, this is this is a, they, there, there was an effort writing this question. Solution that I can use to monitor or track this request to be able to know where the problem is. Both services run in AKS cluster. Would that be tracing? Yeah, like the, the 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 straight answer here is like tracing the ability to track like a single request across its lifecycle, and then you will be able to see the relevant payload that might cause the problem. Um, I would say again, like maybe like also like Commodore can help with those kind of things because we see the, those both application side by side, and then a lot of the time what you see is like one application <laughs> super happy, the other one is keep on crashing, and then it like helps you to know that the other application is crashing. But like tracing is the most straightforward answer for distributed tracing in general. So something like Jager, I'm guessing. Yeah, Jager yeah. Is, is the best, I think, uh, at the moment, like in the open source. Is it to install? Engin, what would be a good practice on incident management? Not to have incidents. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Uh, turn off all the alerts and go to, to sleep. Yeah, one alert the and then you close it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would say that in, I think that in incident management, most of the like hard part is the management <laughs> and, and not, not, the the, incident. not the incident. <laughs> I would say it, it's, it's funny because what we do is we got the alert and then we start to like dig in and find out what is the root cause. But it's very important to make sure that we were right, reflecting what is the current status, maybe to ask some help if it's going like for a long time to for another ideas, because you always need to like gamble and collect more information about what is the next pass and next thing to do. Uh, so I would say make sure that once every like a few minutes you stop and you make sure that what you do at the moment, you can reflect the status so, to some other people. And you're on the right path uh, because then you're like focusing on the, the idea that you have for 30 minutes and you find out your, your system is 30 minutes down you know one challenge i have with incidents is is you know very often very often you cannot really work on an incident while it's happening right sometimes you work on it next day sometimes three months later right, right? depends on priority and what's or not to me the challenge really is how to easily capture everything you might need to resolve the incident whenever you get to the part of resolution, right? Uh, because if I'm not going to work on it right now, I'm probably not willing to spend five hours capturing all the data I need. Otherwise, I wouldn't be postponing the work on it, right? And th that thing kind of going back in time is some yeah. sometimes challenging. Yeah, if we don't I, work on it immediately. Yeah, I think uh, I think that you know the the storing of the data is super important. In the end of the day, like I think I think that you know the best practice I can give to people is to remember that like incident is like a, a long live battle, right? Like it's not that you have a single incident. It's the question of how do you improve incident after incident after incident after incident. So it doesn't really matter where do you start like let's say that you start with zero data and you don't have any tooling the question is if after 10 incidents you are going to be much better in understanding in finding the root cause like it's really important to remember that you if you have an incident and you haven't done anything in order to solve it it is going to happen again like in a very good probability right and you should always be prepared for the next incident and remember okay what should i improve what kind of metrics should I store in advance? What kind of logs should I add to my application? What process do I need to change in how I work? Like, I'm sorry about the light thing here. <laughs> uh, you see, it keeps on like iterating and learning basically. But I think people are very like scared of incident, right? And wow, it's, it is so bad, but it happens to everyone. And like good, good, good engineers or like good SRE are really measured by how they can overcome and how can they learn from like incidents time after time. So like a good postmortem is extremely hard to do, but is like the most vital thing that I, I encourage people to do. I heard uh, the other day I was recording with Darin a podcast 
And I'm going to paraphrase, par paraphrase uh, the, one of the sentences I heard there. I really liked it. And if, it all depends on how you look at the incidences, right? It's an opportunity to improve the system instead of uh, it's, uh, it's a way to find out what are the what are the areas for improvement rather than really problems yeah if you look like at it that way then kind of yeah it's like you know you know everyone you know like there's like the saying that you know if you haven't like deleted a production database you haven't like really worked on something which is significant or like really hardcore so you know you don't need to be stressed about like the incident the issues the problem if you come to 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 see it as like an opportunity, then the next time it's going to be better, or maybe you won't delete the database, right? Like, but everyone are like usually for the long run, right? Like, it's not like there's an incident and the company shuts down. So there is always like the opportunity to learn, and I think uh, yeah, like uh, I really see it that uh, that way. Good good quote, uh, Victor. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's next? Um, Rahul. Uh, ingress versus load balancer. Mm. Is that a versus? No, I'm not no. sure. Like in the end of the day, ingress is usually like spin up load balancer behind the scenes or not behind the scenes. So, so I'm not sure. I think, you know, in, in the past, I, we had those application proxies or application load balancers that had double function. One function would be to have a stable IP. IP to which you can configure your DNS and where requests are coming. Mm -hmm. And then the secondary fun function of that load balancer was to figure out, depending on a request, whether to sh send it to application A or application mm -hmm. B, right? I'm talking pre-Kubernetes. When applications were mostly kind of static as well. Mm -hmm. But now with, with Kubernetes, ingress and it's not ingress versus load balancer because uh, they, each of those serves one of those purposes, right? The job of load balancer in the context of Kubernetes is to be the stable IP, permanent IP to which requests are coming and to forward the request to any of the healthy nodes of the cluster, right? Doesn't matter which one, to make sure that it reaches the cluster to the, at the point that is operational, right? Not to send it to a node that is not healthy. When it enters the cluster, then ingress job of ingress is to figure out whether that request should go here to this application or that application and as a matter of fact you have a third component in that story if you're talking about uh, kubernetes which is service right ingress finds the application and then service forwards to a specific replica of that application but it's definitely not versus yeah, like well, exactly that. Like the ingress is like the routing rule for the load balancer to understand which service, right? And the service include the IPs of all the relevant applications. So yeah, it's like a combination. Like, yeah, I think you explained it like perfectly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, so Ferdin, one sentence, what's the problem Kubernetes solves for the majority of companies in terms of operational complexity? So. It's a one, one sentence challenge. One sentence challenge. Operation is complex. I will say that that's my that's my sentence, right? Like, uh, uh, yeah, I think in one sentence, that's pretty much it. Like the world is complex. I think, you know, a lot of the time, like uh, people are, you know, like are saying that Kubernetes is complex, which is true but it only captures like the inner complexity that your system has internally. Uh, so I think in order like, to understand the problem, you should live in the area before Kubernetes, try to do everything and then go to Kubernetes and then say, wow, it is so much easier. If it's like the load balancing, the auto healing, the deployment, the configuration of different resources, like it solve everything. Like in the end of the day, you have an, a real business logic application you want to make sure that it is deployed in a very stable and easy to upgrade way. And Kubernetes is for me, or like I think the standard in doing it the simplest way possible. So, yeah, not one sentence. I think that yeah. The simplest way possible is actually the key. I mm -hmm. very often hear that Kubernetes is complex and that's absolutely true. Yeah. But I would argue 
that today for many of the things that Kubernetes done, does, we do not have an easier way to do it. So no. it's complex because it does complex stuff. But I dare anybody to discard Kubernetes and make a fault tolerant, highly available system uh, that will be monitored and that will collect logs and that will allow us to do rolling updates or uh, blue green deployment and that will uh, have mutual TLSs and so on and so forth. Right now, the list really depends on what you put inside of your Kubernetes cluster. But honestly, I, I agree it's complex, but I cannot imagine easier way. I mean, I can imagine easier way. I don't know of an easier way to do what it does. Right? It's just no. that it, what it does is complex. It's really complex. And I think the unification of things that Kubernetes brings in terms of configuration and setting everything up, this is like the real value of it. You can create like what you used to have, like three teams, multiple products, and you had to configure each one of them to be perfectly. Uh, and usually you didn't have like a script in some of the cases, so it would done manually. And the unification into one platform that contains a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the networking, a lot of the application into like a few configuration files, it just, it's, it's amazing. And it does a lot of magic. I think we tend to forget that before Kubernetes, we had a lot of experts in, in, in the team. Like you had the networking experts and a load balancing experts, and they do a lot of work in order to make things run. And when you go into Kubernetes, this unification comes to platform engineers and DevOps, as I speak before, and it creates for them an easier way to configure everything. And I think the next step of Kubernetes is going to be unification of more resources and put those into the clusters. There is also the part of the story related to other projects and vendors. Uh, as, a, as a person or a company, right, or a team that has a project, right, that is meant to be distributed to others, Kubernetes provides that common base that we all understand. Before Kubernetes, when I worked in other companies, right, the sheer effort that we had to put to make something work in different permutations that people had was tremendous was easily more than half of the total effort you know kind of okay so this person might be running on windows and that person might be yeah. running on linux and this person might be running on a virtual machine and that like, person oh, might Golan. be using bare metal Golan with uh, multiple uh, distros you know i also wrote like uh, something something similar it does take some of the edge out of like trying to distribute uh, to yeah distribute. but then 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 comes the story of how do you integrate with the rest of somebody's system again yeah, right? Right. in kubernetes we know we have a common api and all this stuff it was such a nightmare that uh kind of, imagine now making commodore work everywhere i kind don't of, want to uh, Victor. i don't want <laughs> i know you don't that, that's what i'm saying you kind of like that would be a that sentence man <laughs> uh so yeah it's a uh, even Windows containers is a nightmare, and it's inside the cluster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Carlos, can Cilium replace Caverno functions? Uh, I don't know what's Caverno functions. Yeah. If the I'm question is, can it replace Caverno? They are very, very different. Nothing to do with each other. Now I have no idea what Caverno functions. Yeah, are. I'm not the expert enough in. Can reverse functions that I also don't know, so I don't have anything smart to say. Are you googling it, Victor? Are you going to answer us? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm googling <laughs> it while you're talking. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe in terms of security, like. Okay, yeah. I, I think that functions there is a uh, misword or something like that. There is Google doesn't know about Caverno functions, so I guess the it's can Cilium replace Caverno and. From what I know, no, because Cilium is about networking, right? Caverno is policies. Yeah, I think you can add like policies to Cilium, no? Am, am yeah, I, but that would one? be network specific yeah. policies. You yeah, would not have policies specific, uh, like uh, your deployment needs to have five replicas, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so so we don't have a good answer, I guess, or no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tend to think they are like complementary, yeah. like enforcing something on the like networking and enforcing something on the configuration. Okay, how can a developer or team convince management to utilize Kubernetes internally and create an IDP? Any suggestions? Okay, like let me give you my two cents and then I, I want to hear your opinions. One of the common reasons I, uh, or answers I have to this question is, if you don't adopt it, you're left out from 95% of the innovation happening right now. That's my pitch, <laughs> kind of like, you, you cannot, you, but most of the new things, most of the efforts that companies are putting today are somehow related to Kubernetes. I'm talking about the tooling, right? You're almost, you, if you don't use Kubernetes, you are basically choosing to ignore, I don't know, like hundreds of new projects. I think that it always comes to like the goal of the management. They want to do something. They want to achieve something. It can be innovation, it can be like acceleration within the development organization, it can be more reliable application. It, it, it needs to be tied to something else that Kubernetes enable for this management. Yeah, I, I will even take it like to the next level, like my simple answer, like management always care about like quantity, right? Not, not like it's like about the money, right? Like there's like nothing else that really matters for companies, they want to succeed and they want like to make a lot of money. Um, and in order to do so, you might want a velocity. So you will tell them it takes us a week to develop. It can take us one day. It can be more on dev productivity. We need a full team to be responsible for the load balancer. With Kubernetes, we can fire all of them or they can do other things and they will be free to do so. So when you try to convince the management, the answer is always like around money or like business goals, right? Which is probably money and try to tie this together. So try to understand where does the company want to go and how can Kubernetes accelerate that process? Like I said, and it is, will probably be around like be, it will probably be around like productivity of like making each developer much more efficient. It might be around the money, by the way, just the utilization inside Kubernetes is much better than what we are currently doing. It might be around the depth speed of like the internal tooling is going to save us so much time and effort or things like that. But any time that you really want to convince your management, I think like that's that's the goal or that's the key. And if you also want like internal developer platform, it's again like the same like game. Like I can take the dev team and make them 10x per more productive with one dev. Sounds good, right? Like uh, so, try to figure out what's the best way of convincing that there will be good outcome of the project. It's like any technical depth project. Don't say like, you know, Java is bad, let's move to Go. Say the concurrency optimization that we're currently doing in Java prevent us from scaling to 10X customers. If we do it in Go, it will be like one container, super simple. And try to tie it to the, like the money of it or like the benefits. Also, one thing that might help Going back to the previous question very quickly, hang out a bit with sales guys from your company. They master the art, how to figure out what the problem is and then pitch the solution. Kind of like you, you need those to figure out how uh, what really keeps management awake at night or even better, what will prevent them from getting their yearly bonuses? If you, you figure know, out what will prevent them from getting yeah. bonuses, you know what is the area but of attack. Victor is, is like the saying in sales that people usually like purchase prior purchase like product out of like two more main motivations. The first one is not to become the villain. Don't be that guy that everyone blames in the destruction of the company. Or they want to be the hero, be the the knight in the shining armor or that you know allow the team to to scale and blah blah blah. So I think, you know, when it comes down to that, it's like saying the, to the management, if we are not going to do that in two years, no developer will join the company. All of the existing developers will leave us. It's going to be bad. It's going to be on you. Or the other way around, like if we enable like Kubernetes, then we're going to be the new kid in the block. It will be super easy for us to develop, to hire more people and so on. 
but you know, in, in like the high level of like sales, like it's the same, right? Like that's the two motivation. You can play on each one of them or will. There we go. Now you know how to. How to sell any product. Like it's not only. Exactly. You know, <laughs> uh, very quick. Uh, uh, before we go to the next question, like this video. It's very important because it helps the algorithm and uh, you know mm -hmm. YouTube stuff. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, join the channel if you can afford it, and uh, convince your boss to sponsor the channel. Kind of that. Those are the four messages. You know what to do. Okay, let's go back to the questions. Um, if you're using EKS, if you're using EKS using Terraform, how do you guys upgrade your nodes? A highly synchronized manual steps. Now correct me, guys. Uh, EKS is using rolling updates, right? Independently uh, of whether you're using Terraform or something uh, else, it will uh, upgrade one node at a time. Uh, right? I think the question, and I might be wrong here, is more on like where do you store the state of Terraform? Like in like that's no, yes, like I maybe, mean, that's maybe. Not, like a lot of the time, the problem is I have Terraform, everything is good. But how do I know that me and you, Victor, for example, are not combating about like who is doing the upgrade? Where does the state lies? Because if not, then you're going to be like in a challenge. But it, maybe it's not the, like the question. Um, if it's the state, then I, I think I might be wrong. I haven't been using in a while Terraform. But uh, mm -hmm. if the state is kept in some external drive, then Terraform will actually uh, prevent second person from running until the first person i think it stores kind of some kind of a lock over there well only um, if you synchronize it's like one of the issues that the, we also like face with helm i think we ended up like storing the state i want to say in github but i might be wrong here uh but uh, like for like good synchronization of like steps like usually it's like a terraform cloud or something like that that provides that functionality but we also not sure what's the there is yeah, there is like a S3 provider, I think it's called, that you can store yeah. uh, the file that stores actually the, the TF state in S3. But is it if the question was, on, I'm not sure if the synchronization of the uh, the Terraform from what is really <laughs> exists or how to do the upgrade. So Shinto, uh, ask another question. Uh, first of all, apologies if I don't know how to pronounce the name. Second put a bit more data and we'll try to get to, to it again hey hello Anais uh Edson do you use any tool for automated testing for of operators do you want to test the operators like usually like we have something that is similar to operator and we wrote our own tests which are kind of live on the cluster and you know kind of things like that but why do you want to test the operators like uh we don't test like Sure with Alice, I guess yeah. if it's operators that you create, then you test like it like anything else. Like clusters, like that's the best way, you know, kind or like a, uh, or a K3S or something like that. Like trying to mock the behavior, at least in our experience, were quite insufficient. So having like a real cluster running real data, like there's like no really good mocking, at least that we figure out. Yeah. So I agree. Like, I didn't find it either, kind of mocking of <laughs> API, Kubernetes, Kubernetes no, API. Uh, like to mock the schedule, mock like different place condition, mock so many things. Like it's easier to run the like, your Kubernetes cluster and do like in full integration test. Uh, Angel or An Angel, uh, how do you envision DevOps in five years and the use of custom resources in Kubernetes? So, I mean, the second part, custom resources, there is no Kubernetes without custom resources. Uh, I, I never saw any serious usage of Kubernetes. It's enough. Sometimes people don't know that there are custom resources, but they are. If you install MongoDB in your cluster, you're getting custom resources. If you install Argo CD, you're getting... Custom resources are such core feature, probably one of the most important features on Kubernetes that that is not going away anytime soon. I cannot say five years. Five years, I don't know. Maybe uh, nobody knows what will happen. But it's not, not going in five years, so you know. Uh, so in five years, I can guarantee that there will be no DevOps, <laughs> simply because. Let me explain. Yeah. Uh, because 
every no. couple of years we slightly modify something and then rename it right uh today's microservices before microservices it was zbs uh uh it, which is essentially similar thing same thing i would even argue from certain perspective that devops is extension of agile so uh, no <laughs> so let me put it this way no uh, every <laughs> single term in software gets replaced within five years uh, by Victor, some other I, I just google you know we have jenkins for like 11 years it's like another technology that like uh, keeps on like uh, people uh, like loves to bury right and in the end of the day like <laughs> technology yes right technology stays <laughs> but the term kind of like uh, like nobody speaks about agile anymore it's not that it disappeared but kind yeah. of it's not it's not cool anymore right uh the it's term cool. i'm talking about literally the word devops yeah, will be it will change for some other it will like there will be the all the devops right like uh, like the dinosaurs that are still devops and then there will be like the new, the new kid in the block that's that's what i think yeah <laughs> yeah uh do you have any tips for cke C, cka certification uh I, I never took the certification, so I cannot answer this one. I don't know if any of you guys took certification. No, no, no. Can, can't say I have. Sorry. Learn. Sorry, uh, wrong crowd. <laughs> Is Helm dying? Is GitOps the new sexy thing? Uh -huh. Again, I, I don't I don't think that GitOps and Helm are kind of, it's not that one is replacing another to begin with. So uh, those are completely unrelated from my perspective. Helm is how we package Kubernetes manifests or template Kubernetes manifests. And GitOps is how we synchronize something in Git with a cluster, right? Uh, and Helm, I'm not personally, and this is personally, this is not the industry, right? <laughs> I'm not fond of Helm for my own applications, but that does not matter because all third party applications uh, are defined for Kubernetes as Helm, kind of. Uh, there is nothing even close in terms of um, in terms of the sheer number of packages that you can use to deploy stuff in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, like I agree. It's like separate things. Uh, I think the GitOps is like uh, the new shiny kid of infrastructure as code let's say um it's really sexy and i wouldn't say new but it's like kind of new uh i don't think helm will die soon uh like we just released the helm dashboard and it gained a lot of popularity of visualizing and actually get like dashboard to helm and i think the popularity this kind of open source project gained in like a matter of days uh really like kind of project of how it's going to look like in the future uh, <coughs> i like these packages of third parties uh, you just put one command everything runs fine uh, for internal usage i'm also a fan of uh, <laughs> but like there is like a lot of things to consider in here yeah uh, i think that the thing that like Confused people around Helm, and one of the reasons like that our like open source project around Helm dashboard was so successful, is the fact that Helm is doing like three really different things in one single project, right? Like it can do the templating by itself, it can do the deployment itself, right? Like, like it manages the releases on your cluster, and you can also package your things and like put them on the cloud, so it can do all of those three all of those three things. External vendors like vendors use ex mainly like the package part and the ability to release it. And like they also like utilize the, the templating area. I think GitOps is, you know, some GitOps also use Helm. Some like don't try to move Helm out of the equation. I can say that we ran like an internal statistic on Commodore users, right? Like just checking latest trends and things like, like that. There was like, for example, like Grafana was used by 25% of the customers or something like that. Helm was used by 100% of the customers. Argo was, I think, like 15 or something like that. So um, I don't think Helm is dying. Uh, I, because of the vendors, it's not even close to dying. But also for internal usage, for local development, like I'm a real fond of 
like Helm is a project. And uh, I think its main problem is that it does so many things quite well, right? And it's just barely good enough to pass, but still everyone is using it because there's like no better alternative. GitOps is around like doing one very clear thing, like synchron synchronizing of the Git status with what is running in your cluster. So it's like a, like a very pinpoint thing that is quite good, but not really contradict. Yeah, I completely forgot about Helm CLI. <laughs> when I said one is not excluding the other, I was really thinking about, I like that you actually defined that there are three operations, kind of there is templating and packaging. That's not going away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I uh, will say but, uh, yeah. You know, because among other things, rewriting kind of the whole world is now defined as Helm packages, right? Rewriting that is not happening anytime soon. Now, theoretically, tomorrow we might have a better way to actually deploy those charts, but the charts themselves, that stays. And GitOps yeah. does replace the deployment part, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know, like when I learned the Helm like yeah, six years ago, I was so confused because, you know, I'm used to like uh, something do like one thing, right? Like, I don't know, like pip is like you want to install or to package packages. That's it. You won't run your pipeline. You don't do like pip run in order to run Python. But Helm somehow like managed to do all of those three things and it simply works for them. Like I was in a lecture by Kelsey that said that Helm template is like the worst thing that ever happened to Kubernetes or something like that. But in the end of the day, you know, it is, I hope I, I quote him right here, right? Uh, but in the end of the day, it is so popular because everyone can use it. It's like very, very simple to use and, and works without any external dependencies. It is quite like magical, like so much, so little in order to, to get the first usage. Yeah. Okay, we have nine more minutes. Let's do a couple more questions. When should the company use cluster API instead of, for example, many managed clusters? So VMware, Azure, and AWS. Today, I think that I'm getting confused, guys, uh, because I ask with every question, one is not really replacing the other, right? Cluster no, API is I... used to manage your clusters, right? It's just kind of replacement for Terraform, let's say, yeah, to say I something. Yeah. I think the, yeah, the question is about creation. I don't know, like it's like Terraform, right? Like I'm in favor of like doing the, like I, from even like from one cluster, I'm in favor. Like I didn't use cluster API enough. Like, we do use Terraform more for like the cluster creation, but overall, like if you have one cluster in production, I would suggest doing it like in the GitOps way and have like everything infrastructure as code at least, right? Like, so in cluster API versus Terraform, not sure, like we don't run like thousands of different clusters like that. So I'm not an expert enough on what, yeah. which one is better. I think it's like, it's it's pretty strange to store like information about other clusters. Why wow, I like it? I like in it. one cluster, it's like it's... a meta. It's like uh, you know, like and where do you store this cluster uh, cluster API? Like uh, third all the, all the way down, right on a different cluster. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I know it's kind of the egg and the chicken like <laughs> problem. Uh, Ipos, how will I perform blue green deployment between two separate? Oh my, two separate <laughs> Kubernetes clusters. Is it possible to do this? If yes, is there any open source tool to do it? I'm going to, you guys, if you want to answer, cool. I'm going to reject answering this question without understanding why would you have want to have release one in this cluster? And why, Victor? It's nice. It's nice. Like, yeah. I, I, I can like it. I, I, I don't mind like the, the, the thing here. It's mainly when you are very, very afraid out of like busy neighbors and you are afraid that like one environment is going to hurt the other one, I guess. But but that's not blue green, man. That's kind of like you're talking about having one application in one cluster, another one in. But this no, is the, the same, same application. No, it's the same, same, Victor. It's the same. But if you release, let's say you release both applications to the same cluster, then one application might hurt the other application because they're running on the same cluster, utilizing the same resources and so on. So you are like okay. very paranoid, right? So you are running it on two different clusters altogether, right? So you don't want each one to know the other one. And then usually, what I would suggest to do is like to use a lot external load balancer that is unrelated to Kubernetes that will route the blue green between those clusters. So you need to solve it from like the load balancer standpoint 
and not the Kubernetes standpoint. In terms of like open source solutions, didn't do it like for quite a lot of time, but it's not that hard if you're using like a normal external load balancer to route between the two. I, I would say that actually uh, I met someone. This is actually <laughs> its use case. Uh, what I wanted to achieve is like, instead of upgrading Kubernetes clusters in place, just to create a new one. And then it's not like a blue green of a deployment. It's more blue green of the old cluster. Uh, mm. And then they need like to uh, like send the traffic or route the traffic to the other cluster. It's sensitive, very sensitive and unique use case. I don't know any tool that does that because you need to change configuration outside of the cluster. Yeah, but not, not that hard. Like but we did it even like in the free Kubernetes world, right? Like draining the <laughs> Right, with Nginx or HA proxy or any of those, you can easily yeah, configure like, them. Yeah, you know, like it's not a real uh, new use case. Like route there, route there. Call this one blue, this one green. That's it. But you don't want to. With essentially, yeah. You know, if it, if you switch now to doing this in a single cluster, what you just described is essentially what the tools of that kind are doing. Not really uh, exceptionally complex kind of Argo rollouts or uh, Flagger. Yeah. That's what they do. They're just modifying your yeah. ingress or your service to say 20% there, 80% there, or everything here, everything there. It's just a fancy way to configure Nginx. Yeah, yeah, Equivalent. Like, no. Yeah, no, not, uh, not hard. Uh, easy to say, right? Hard to implement. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That... <laughs> but it's also the, the managing of the replica set that you get out of the box, which is cool. You don't need like yeah to... no no there's much more in in Argo workflow no, no, Argo no. rollouts but yeah it's a cool project. Uh, what else uh, do we have? Okay, maybe two more questions. Max, uh, is there a way to stop termination of Kubernetes resources like namespace? Uh, you can use policies for that, right? Yeah, but it prevents um, it. Like, what does it mean stopping after after someone said delete it and it started the deletion? I'm, I'm guessing to prevent humans. To delete, oh. I'm guessing. If oh, yeah. if the question is how can we prevent pod from ever failing, <laughs> <laughs> not gonna, not it's not going to happen. But if the question is how to prevent a human from saying cube cattle delete, then policies or permissions. You don't even yeah. need policies, right? Just permissions. Oh. There are also like, uh, you know, like web books and things like that, that can prevent, like, I don't remember the name in Kubernetes that, you know, listen and like safeguard your different resources. Admission controllers. Admission yeah. controllers. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's, that's like Caverna yeah. that we mentioned earlier. That's basically a fancy way to manage yep, those to admission controllers. Yeah. Uh, Avatar Gray, what is the best way of development? Adapting infrastructure to the code or adapting code to the infrastructure? No idea what's the question, so I will let <laughs> yeah. you, Victor, answer answer the question. No, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, I cannot adapt the infrastructure to code, or I'm not, you know, kind of like I'm. I'm not sure. I understand. I, I don't get it. So, uh, <laughs> let's go to the next one. Sorry for that, Avatar Gray. Uh, no hard feelings. I have no idea what. Uh, I, I don't understand what you're trying and to. And privately, ask. Twitter and so on. <laughs> yeah, ping, ping on Twitter or LinkedIn or anything. If self-healing concept still alive, uh, I mean, Kubernetes, basically what it does is self-healing up to a level, out of the yeah. box, and then we have additional, it's still alive. Yeah, yeah. I will say like Andre is like, you know, the creator of like the Helm dashboard that we mentioned like earlier, like the open source project. So yeah. I think... No, no, it's like a celeb in the, <laughs> in the channel. So I, I will say... You know, like a lot of people are talking about helping not only like in terms of like restarting the pods, right? Like this is basically what Kubernetes is doing, but something more complex than that. And like most applications that I saw that try to be like self-healing uh, are not really working. It's like some fancy reconciliation mechanism or things like, like that. But usually like you end up with like unhealed version. So, yeah. I, I have to say that in Argo CD in the UI, you have like, like the self healing. <laughs> yeah, there's checkbox. a button. Yeah, there is a button. What called... does it do? 
I'm not sure, <laughs> but you don't want not to take it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, like to be honest, I didn't saw it. Like, is it uh... checks box? The feeling, yes, <laughs> yes or no? Yes, but I'm not sure it does anything. Let's let's check. Let's check it like later on. Like, what does it do? <laughs> so, uh, you tell me when you're gonna check, and I'm going to double check whether Commodore is still running after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like now we can. Kind of like, that will be the ultimate something. proof, kind of like. Commodore yeah. is down, hands don't press that button in Argo City. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's check it out. So uh we're at the end of the session. Uh everybody check Commodore, really cool. Highly recommend it. Uh thank you guys for attending the session. Thank you everybody for for listening to us, asking questions. See you again next every Thursday that I'm not traveling. So you need to guess when, how that works. Nobody knows. <laughs> Share your calendar, uh, Victor, and check out the Helm dashboard as well, like the open source yeah. project. <laughs> exactly. Helm dashboard. If, if I Google Helm dashboard Commodore, I will find it, right? Yeah, number one, SEO. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye.